is, um, this is the anniversary for us, Warren. It's the fifth anniversary of your first appearing here. Uh, the first time that he was here in 2008 was an electric uh, moment. It was early October. Lehman had, fa had failed two weeks before. AIG had been uh, taken over by the government. Um, the TARP bill had not been passed. It, it was going to be passed before the uh, MPW was over, but it had not been passed at that morning. And uh, things were not looking good. So I did have one preliminary comment uh, to make to Warren, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But I then turned to him was and said, OK, how bad is it out there? And he said, it, I went back and looked at the video, and he said, it's bad. It's like nothing I've ever seen. It's an, an economic Pearl Harbor in which creditworthy companies cannot get financing. We will pull out of it, but it's going to take time. So I would think uh, we would say, looking back, that that was a sound ass assessment, and we will come back to the recovery. Even so, here we are, five years later, once again in the middle of financial trouble. And I'd like to ask you, Phil, and, and I'd like to say once more, Warren, how bad is it out there? Well, it's not so bad in the economy. It, it's bad for a great many of our citizens. Overall, though, the economy's done very well. I mean, the, uh, uh, it, it's been a slow recovery, but it was a extreme wound that the economy had received, like none in my lifetime. So it's not, not totally surprising that it's taken us a while to come back. But uh, ever since the fall of 2009, the recovery has come back steadily. It, it, it hasn't accelerated, mm -hmm. but it hasn't flattened out either. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way it is now. And, uh, you know, even 2% a year growth, uh, if the population grows 1%, that means in, in a generation, people are living on average 20% better than the generation before. That is not bad. It'd be better if it's 3%. But, right. but we have a wonderful economy, and, and you've seen it heal faster than the other major economies around the world. Well, let's come back to that in just a second. Let's talk about the debt ceiling uh, problem. And let me ask that question again. How bad is that? Well, it, it, if, if, if it really, if, if it goes on a few days, I mean, if, if we really uh, don't get it resolved in a day or two, it's, it's absolutely terrible. I mean, I, I've told my children that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and it takes 20 minutes to ruin it. And, we Five have, minutes. Pardon me? Five minutes. Well, Five yeah, minutes. With particularly some of my kids. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, but we have spent 237 years since 1776 building a reputation, uh, you know, as the most wonderful country in, in, on earth, and one that's entrusted with having the reserve currency of the world, the one who, when they say full faith and credit, nobody questions it. And that could. Well, that is being put in jeopardy now, and it could be it could be destroyed in a little while. And, and, a, and a great reputation, as I say, is, is like virginity. It can be re it can be preserved, but it can't be restored. And, and uh, uh, at least that's what my dad told me. <laughs> the, uh, so it, it, it is it is it is absolute folly to uh, even think about it, and it will be. I mean, I don't know what the words are to describe it if, if we actually would default. Uh, I can't believe it'll be done because uh, it just is so stupid. And I think that the whole idea of a, of a debt limit is a terrible, terrible mistake. I mean, if you're going to spend more than you take in, what are you going to do except raise the debt limit? So it becomes this political weapon of mass destruction. It really is like a nuclear bomb. It's something. Maybe you can talk about it, but you can't even dream of using it. We, we dropped two atom bombs in 1945. We've never done it since. Now, we've been frustrated by all kinds of governments. We, we, we had a war in Vietnam that we, you know, we did not get a satisfactory resolution to. We've had other wars. But we didn't think about we were going to drop nuclear bombs. I mean, there, there are certain things that just don't, should not be used in a, in, a, in a civilization. And the idea of breaking the government's promises to achieve any other end, whether it's gun control, abortion, Obamacare, whatever it is, tying it to that is, is, is madness. You can argue those other things out, but 
leave, get the debt ceiling out of the picture. Well, and here we are, um, uh, two days away from uh, the supposed, um, well, it is, the actual um, uh, moment at which uh, we do not raise it or do raise it. Um, and do you have a kind of scenario in mind as, how, as to how we will get from here to actually solving this problem? Well, I think the way to solve it is just to say the debt ceiling, both parties to say the debt ceiling will never be used as a weapon of mass destruction. It's off the table. We'll argue about all kinds of other things and, and see how they come out. But we are not going to say, we are not going to threaten the world and our own citizens with the fact that we aren't going to make good on our promises to achieve some other end. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Well, and, and seeing the political climate in Washington, can you imagine that happening in the next couple of days? I, I can't imagine that the full thing playing out that way, although I wish it would. But maybe it will have, maybe this has been the demonstration project we needed. I mean, uh, you know, we, it, uh, we didn't know exactly what atomic weapons could do until we did them. And, and, and then it was an important, it was an incredible goal, obviously, at the time. But we decided we didn't want to do that again, no matter how serious things got. And, and uh, uh, I, I hope that comes out of it. But I think that what, w I think basically, it, uh, you know, you, you really need to, House Republicans to, to say, oh, you know, this is a weapon we shouldn't have used, and we'll, we think Obamacare, Obamacare is terrible, and you know, we'll fight it out, and we'll beat you in 2014 in the elections and prove it, and so on. But, but we will not, we will not say that the United States is going to break its promises to millions and millions of citizens in other countries and everything, just because we're not getting our way. And how about the prospect that it will just be pushed forward uh, to the end of January or something? That, that seems to be our specialty. I mean, we've that, gotten good at that. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we don't know how to solve problems, but we sure know how to postpone them. <laughs> and uh, that may be what happens. I'll be disappointed if it does, but, but, but it I, may. I think all of us will just hate to go through this. Well, it's ridiculous. I, and, I mean, why, why, why do it? I mean, you know, it, it, uh, no, I, it, uh, if you have a problem, you face it, you know, and, and, but, and, and the debt ceiling is a problem that we can get rid of it being a problem. Then we'll have a lot of other problems and we can fight those out on their own turf, but to just push it down the road, I mean, you know, the people go through Christmas wondering you know, how's all this all gonna come out and they appoint a super committee, which turns out to be a mini committee and all kinds of things. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Well, uh, considering the confusion we are in, has this um, affected your decisions about running Berkshire in any way? Not one iota. We, we, we announced the acquisition this morning. It was over in England, so it was at 3 a.m., I think, for a purchase for a 1.1 billion. It didn't affect a dollar of the price that we put in. We did not put in a clause that said if, if Congress does this or that, that this, because the deal hasn't closed for a while, that the deal will be off or anything like that. It doesn't affect anything. This country is going to do well over time. I want to participate in it. I'll participate through owning good businesses. And if we get a chance to buy a good business, we buy it. And I will say this, Charlie Munger, my partner, and I have worked together now for 54 years. We've made a lot of decisions on buying businesses. We've made a lot of decisions on buying stocks. In the conversations that accompanied those decisions, neither one of us has ever once brought up anything of a macro nature, period. And it just doesn't make any difference. I don't know what's going to happen next week or next month or next year. I know what's going to happen over 10 or 20 years. And, and why concern myself with the things I, I, I can't know and don't understand? One of the important things are something I, I think I do understand. And what would you say to this audience? Many of, of them who have, are making decisions, real-time decisions about what to do, how would you extend Full that Full speed ahead. <laughs> okay, all right, I think we got that message. I really didn't expect you to say anything. <laughs> I, say. No, I mean, it's, I bought my first stock, you know, in April of 1942. You know, they, after Pearl Harbor, we had nothing but bad news for six months. The headlines every day were, you know, that we were having trouble with the Corregidor Baton, you know, you name it. And, uh, you know, the Dow was at about 100. And, you know, the news was terrible. But I and practically every American I knew thought we were going to win the war. And, and uh, the stock I bought was cheap. It got quite a bit cheaper in the next few months. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've been buying stocks ever since. Right. And always being glad in a way that it got cheaper because you can buy at a cheaper price. I, I, I love a sale. I, you know, I, know. I mean, just I know. try me out. <laughs>
Mark down the price of fortune and I'll extend my subscription for 20 years. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> And uh, the recovery, uh, just to dwell on that a second. Do you see it at this moment slowing any, or do you see it uh, just going along at this steady upward pace? I can't tell you about the last week, but I can tell you about the last month. I mean, because I get figures on 70 plus companies, you know, in pretty much real time. And the recovery ever since the fall of 2009 has been going up at a modest rate. And, and People talk about double dips. There wasn't going to be any double dip. They talk about acceleration. There hasn't been any real acceleration. The, the line of ascent is just about like it's been now for, for five years, uh, almost, uh, well, four, four, four and a fraction years. We will, we project that our railroad uh, in the week of November 5th, I believe, will hit or maybe slightly exceed the car loading peak reached before Lehman. Uh, really? and, but it's taken four or five years to get there. Amazing. We are seeing, we own the second largest real estate brokerage firm in the country, and so I get the, what they call pending transactions even before they complete, and, and I get the median prices at which the deals are being made, and I get them from a lot of markets all over the country, and I just got them for September, and you know, the median price is up, and the pendings are up, and, uh, the country is coming back. You can't, you can't stop the United States. I mean, it, it, uh, we, we get through everything. I mean, we, you know, we got through a civil war. We got through the Great Depression. We got through world wars. The country works. Why is it that at every perilous moment that people start to say, this is the time that it's really not going to? Well, they get scared. I mean, uh, no, the humans, 500 years from now, people will panic periodically. I mean, they... they Fear is incredibly contagious. I mean, it, when, when people got worried about their money market funds in September of 2008, you had 30 million Americans with three and a half trillion dollars, half of all the bank, bank, amount of bank deposits in money market funds. A week earlier, none of them were worried. And within a couple of days, everyone that had a money market fund was worried. And that was something they didn't expect to be worried about. And they looked at their neighbor and they were worried. And at that time, in three days, 5% of all the money market. I mean, there was a run on money market funds like you can't believe, and I give great credit to the government for taking the actions that they did. So fear is, spreads instantaneously. Confidence comes back through the door one at a time. I mean, it, it, people do not, there's not, not such a thing as mass resumption right. of confidence, but there is, fear just takes over. And yeah. that'll happen again. And what is your rule about investing? Well, you want, to be, you want to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Right. And uh, I've got plenty of greed, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the fearful part. <laughs> and just because I shouldn't skip this, uh, this real life fact, what company did you buy uh, that announced the buying today? Well, we bought a company from another company in England, and it's called Cornelius, and it makes it makes uh, equipment which dispenses and cools wonderful beverages like Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. <laughs> which you hope they will. Well, we, we, even may put, we may even put a little dispenser. We've got a dispenser in the office, but we'll now have an improved one. And this goes into what company within Berkshire? This goes into Marmon. Marmon, Marmon itself uh, owns probably 130 companies. It's, it's a huge conglomerate itself. We bought it from the Prisker family. We're just completing the purchase of 100%. And uh, it's an important business for Berkshire. We have five, what I call uh, the powerhouse five. And those five companies will, Marmon's one of them. In aggregate, they'll earn well over $10 billion pre-tax this year. Good. Good. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> the um, more the better. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I'm going to uh, switch the subject um, to women. Um, well, I said that five years ago, before I got into the matter of how bad it was um, uh, in that crisis, I had made one point to the audience, um, and I have and I never had any reason to change it. And that point was that among all the business executives I knew, and I, I, I have known an awful lot over the years, uh, that Warren is uh, the most unbiased about gender and ethnicity, ethnicity of any of that I have ever seen. He just simply has no bias about gen gender. He does have a bias, uh, a strong one, about uh, competence, intelligence, and um, character. 
but those three things uh, are, are the only ones that he thinks about and he simply thinks about and no others. Now, having said that, repeated that very good thing about him, I'm about to uh, turn oh. into a tough reporter. Oh, OK, here we go. <laughs> but. Uh, but, uh, OK. The point is, uh, and this is what I want to bring up, uh, and I, uh, first, before I, I do bring it up, well, Warren wrote an article for Fortune that ran this spring called uh, Warren Buffett is bullish, dot, 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 on women. And if any of you miss it, uh, you must uh, go back and get it. As a matter of fact, you can even get it um, in my book called Tap Dancing to Work, which we are just putting out in the paperback uh, version. And I have an opportunity there, writing an introduction for this article, to editorialize a little bit. A bit. And so uh, here's what that introduction says. It says that despite these uh, strong feelings you have about the competence of women and their ability to completely uh, support and uh, build uh, the, uh, the economy, that you were very slow in getting on the policy, chain, uh, policy train of putting women on your board. Right. Yes. I was, uh, actually, I didn't want to put anybody on the board, but they've got. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. But when you looked around, you didn't uh, exactly no. uh, jump to put women on the board. No. Um, and the first woman, uh, Charlotte Guyman, who's here, she went on, and I meant to look up the date, and now I've forgotten what it was, uh, 2008. It would, it would be. Charlotte? Yeah, 10 to 12 years ago, something like yeah, that. It's, yeah, it's, it's quite a while ago. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, Sue Decker went on. Yeah. Uh, a majority of the people in the last 10 years have been women. Um, well, yeah. that's very true. And Meryl, uh, and Meryl Whitmer went right. on. So there are three out of a board that has how many? 12. 12. And why do you think? But there are five over 80, and okay. they're all men. <laughs> so <laughs> believe me, you got demographics this, this working is, for you. <laughs> 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 so why do you think that you were a little bit slow in doing this? Well, to be perfectly honest, I, who knows exactly? I, I will tell you why I think it was so generally. I, I, I really didn't, we didn't want to put anybody on the board until the rules started coming in about having you know, independent directors and all that. I mean, the, the board was not a big deal at Berkshire at all. Uh, you know, I, I have a friend that used to like to own 100% of any company that he had, because he, he liked to look in the mirror and say, all my shareholders love me. And <laughs> I've always, <laughs> that has a nice ring to it. I, I, I like to look in the mirror and say, enough of my shareholders love me. And for a long time, it was treated almost as private business. It came out of, Berkshire Hathaway came out of a partnership I ran, which I ran all by myself. I mean, I was the only general partner. So it sort of had that history. And, and uh, uh, so Charlie and I, uh, I mean, we had a board because we were required to have a board, but the, the board did not do much uh, in the past. And then certain legal requirements uh, got added over time. And, and, and frankly, you know, I love the idea that of the, of the directors that are 60 and under, half of them are women now, and, and there'll be more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh that sounds like a yeah, good You know, I'm on tape here. Yeah, I mean, you can tell me <laughs> later on. <laughs> OK. Um, now, I'm going to turn to questions from the audience. Um, and, uh, if they're not crystal clear, uh, I may, for both the audience's benefit and Warren's, because he, uh, he, gets, uh, he goes to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, and the first thing he always says, pointing to Charlie Munger sitting by him, he said, Charlie can't see, and I can't hear. So that's uh, why we work together. I mean, we, <laughs> I can't remember his name anymore, and he can't remember mine. But we we so, need each other. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be looking for questions. It's always difficult up here to see. Yeah, I can't see much. Uh, if, if any, who has their hand up? Who has a mic in their hand? Um, point point me where I should be pointing. There's a light on over there. there. How about back there? Okay. Hi. Uh, general question about um, your thoughts. You said you bought your first stock in 1942. Um, I think right around that time, sometime after World War II, I think prior to that, the sterling was the, was the world currency. Then it switched to the U.S. dollar not too long after that. Uh, at the time, any other country, um, very similar to markets today, you have to be able to cover your debt. You have to be able to, uh, you know, have enough uh, in order to, to borrow against, at that time, the, the sterling. And now we're looking at a situation with the, uh, the amount of debt ceiling. I think what's different between now 
and ever before is there is the risk of it, the devaluation or the issue of the US dollar not being the world currency. What's your views? Do you see that happening? Because there's an awful lot of fear and discussion uh, about it now. Yeah. I, <clears throat> unless we do something incredibly foolish, and I don't think we will, the dollar will be the world's currency for a long, 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 long time. Uh, the, we came out of World War II actually with a higher debt to GDP than we have now. Uh, and uh, we, all of our debt is printed in our own currency. I mean, that's the key. And then the question is, do you abuse that in some way so that the currency declines in value at a rapid rate? Well, interestingly enough, I was born in 1930. The dollar from 1930 uh, is worth about six cents today. So I've lived during a period where the dollar's lost 94% of its value in terms of purchasing power. And yet at the same time, in real terms, the GDP of the country per capita has gone up six for one. So we've had six for one, just think of that, one person's lifetime. Uh, we went centuries in the world where the gains were in nothing in a century or a few percent, and six for one in one person's lifetime. At the same time, our currency has decreased, you know, by, in, in a, in a, by uh, uh, well, it went from a dollar to six cents, and, and that, 94%, and that, uh, despite all of that, we are the world's reserve currency, and people are willing to lend us the money, lend us money for nothing, virtually, uh, currently in, in in large sums, and I, I, I do not see that changing unless we do something incredibly foolish. Now we have to stabilize the the debt as a percentage of GDP, which means we can have debt increase by two to three percent a year if GDP grows two to three percent a year, and I think that's a very re realistic possibility. We can't keep having debt grow at a faster rate than GDP, although there's. It can go on for a long time, and it has gone on for a long time. Uh, our country, you know, the, the people think it's falling apart. I think it, that's not remotely the case. I was just on a program this morning with, with Sarah Blakely and, and, and Fred Smith. I mean, here are two people, you know, that it took something very common, you know, the Postal Service and airplanes or something, and they saw needs and they filled them, and, and they're thinking of new things to do tomorrow. I mean, the, the secret sauce in America, you know, is basically, you know, the people in this room and, and the fact that you're all trying to make your life better tomorrow and you'll come up with ways to do it. So the country works and it may get gummed up somewhat by Washington sometimes, but it, it won't get ruined. Um, another question, and, and I should have mentioned this before, would you uh, state who you are before asking the question? Is it, where are we? Oh, so hard to see. I have one here. Okay. Mary Erdos, JP Morgan Asset Management. Right over on your right. On our right. Okay, okay. over here. Here we are. Okay. okay over here. Good morning. Um, so, as we went through the introductions this morning, there were a whole host of uh, women who were talking about either taking their companies public uh, and actually a few of them taking their companies private. And I thought uh, if we could just hear from you on your thoughts on the pros and cons of the public versus private company. Yeah. Carol and I have belonged to a group that started in 1968 called the Graham Group. We meet, and at one time we had a session with two enormously successful uh, people that, on the panel, and I, I assigned the topic, and one of them uh, said he'd give up half his net worth to be pr private again, and, and the other one you know, gave exactly the reverse answer. I, I started out feeling like I wanted to be private. I'd run a, pri I'd run a private partnership, and I, I just enjoyed it that way. You know, I like looking in the mirror and making decisions and not getting any negative votes, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, when I, we, dis, we distributed a bunch of Berkshire shares as part of winding up the partnerships, and it already was a public company, it became more public then. And over time, I found it actually more fun to run a public company, but it, it, it's become a podium. It's, it's where I can, I can, uh, play out my ideas and explain why I do things and have a lot of fun and Carol has my letter to make them more readable and, and uh, it's, it's a teaching mechanism even. Uh, I would say generally speaking that, well, when people come to me with wonderful businesses and they do and they talk about selling them to me, my first advice is don't sell them. I mean, a wonderful business is 
they're too rare. And if you've got one in your family, keep it unless something forces you to sell it. So I would say stay private unless you have a need to go public in terms of financing or in terms of solving the problems of ownership within a family that's going in different directions or something. But you can always, you can always go public, uh, and unless there's a compelling reason to do it, which is usually fundraising, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the reason to do it. And going private, you can do it, but that creates a lot more problems because you really have, now you're, you're, you're faced with buying out your partners unilaterally, and you know, Michael Dell just went through that. That's not something I would wanna do. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I would stay private, and then if you really get the urge to cash in, I've got an 800 number. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, just for to interrupt here with a question, how about the flurry of activists that we see out there <clears throat> these days? What uh, what message you, would you have for people trying to deal with them? Well, I I, I I believe basically that I'm running Berkshire for the people that are are, are going to stay in and not the ones who want to get out. I mean, you know, that, I, you give. You, give, you, you try to have a decent market and everything for people that want to get out. But basically, I am, I'm concerned with the people that want to stay in. And of course, most of the activists want to rattle the cage and, and get management to do something that will give a spurt to the stock, which may not be in the long-term interest of the company. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've seen cases, I've seen plenty of cases where managements are doing things where they deserve a little shaking up. But uh, uh, I do think that the more in running a business, we don't make quarterly estimates ever. I, uh, you know, I, I don't care what the company earns this quarter. You know, I, I, I really care about what we're gonna be five or 10 years from now. And, and it doesn't make any difference if I ship a lot of stuff at the last day of the quarter and get some extra few pennies a share in or something. I don't wanna be thinking that way. I don't want our managers thinking that way. And I don't want stockholders who expect me to think that way. So uh, I, I, if an activist comes along to Berkshire you know, and says, we think you ought to do a, this and that. I'll say, fine, start your own company, and you do it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can add that you have a bias against activists. Somewhat, yeah. yeah they, right. I, there's, there are plenty of managements that deserve some shaking up, yes. though, too. I, I don't want to come down and say that all activists are all bad. And should, but overwhelmingly, I do not believe in running a company to respond to people who want to sell their stock in the next few months. Right, right. Uh, question? Uh, once again. Um, Hi, I'm Melody Hobson. So okay. I want to do a follow-up question to the first question about the currency issue. A lot of that is coming from rhetoric from China that the global economy should be de-Americanized and internationalized is the word that is being used. And I was in China last week where a Chinese official call, called this the century of the Pacific, that the last century was the century of the Atlantic which was the US and Western Europe, and this century is the century of the Pacific. I wonder what you think about China, their growing influence, them being our largest debt holder, et cetera, and what uh, the long-term prospects are for the emerging markets. Yeah, well, you, your friend sounds to me more like an ad man than an economist, but the, uh, 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 China is gonna be enormously important, and they should be. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it is an, an it will be an economic powerhouse, but so will the United States be. And, and what is important is that the two countries largely learn to get live together. I mean, there's no, we are going to both be superpowers and, and we've got a lot of common interests and we've got some things we differ on and, and that'll always be the case. But the thing to remember is overwhelmingly we should figure out how to get along. It, it, but the United States will be the superpower of the world for a very, very, very long time. China will be gaining in importance for a very, very, very long time, but they start from a lower base. They also have a whole lot more people, so that at some point in aggregate, they're, they're going to catch us in GDP. In terms of GDP per capita, I wouldn't want to bet on that one. Well, and, and their political systems, uh, would you, uh, what would you say about that, assuming ours is working correctly? Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> It's tough for me to figure out what's happening in this country, it really exists, but, then, well, the interesting thing is, in 1790, we had a little under four million people. China had 300 million people. They had similar resources. They had similar climate. They worked just as hard. They were just as smart. And in the next 200 years, you know, we got, so we had 25% of the world's GDP, starting with these four million people, and they didn't really go anyplace. And then, in the last 40 or 50 years, they have just galloped forward. And so they are starting to unleash human potential in China 
the same way we've been unleashing human potential since 1776, and, and I'm all for that. The, we should much prefer to have a prosperous China than a China that has problems. I mean, you know, if you postulate two worlds, one in which we're an island of prosperity, 315 million people, and the rest of the world is sitting there envious of, you know, that, or postulate something where the rest of the world is growing even faster than we are, but we're also benefiting. I mean, just choose which world you want, and then think about which world you want if the other guy's got some nuclear weapons and happens to be envious of the, I mean, it, it is in our interest that the rest of the world does well, and, and, and in particular, China. Question? Good morning. Right there, okay. Barbara Novick with BlackRock. Uh, first of all, I, I love your enthusiasm and your optimism. Have you given any thought to retirement planning and the, the longevity problem? Not for yourself, throw her out, but throw facing, her out. facing the country. Um, and, and what should we as a society be doing to help people who are clearly going to live a lot longer? Yeah. I, 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 I'm 83 and I'm having more fun than I've ever had in my life. So it, 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 you know, the, the, the main thing to do is, being, is to be involved with something you love. I mean, I tell the students that and, 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 and something, I tell them to get, take the job you'd take if you're already independently rich. Well, that's what I've got. And uh, it's, uh, the, we are going to have a problem in this country. Kind of, we're not gonna have a problem in terms of turning out more and more stuff. I mean, the, the market system works marvelously in turning out things people want. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's, it's the marvel of the world, and it'll continue to be. I mean, it, you know, whether you, look at what just Apple's done in you know, recent years. Oh, it, it, the market system works on turning out stuff. The more specialized it becomes, the more people it will leave behind in terms of getting the bounty of that, unfortunately. And, and frankly, that's where government has to come in. You know, we have gone uh, in 1982, the Forbes 400, I apologize for using the term here, but the Forbes 400 had 90 billion of net worth. They had 2 trillion, 20 billion this year, over 20 times as much, uh, all time record. The people in this room overwhelmingly are doing better than they were five years ago. The people who will serve us lunch later on are not. And uh, it, the trickle down has not, does not work very well. It's still better than being in an economy that doesn't go anyplace, but, but we have solved the problem of more and more goods. We have not solved the problem of having a country with $50,000 of GDP per person and having 20% of the families, 25 million families, 60 million people living in, in households with $21,000 of income or less. And you know, that's our challenge. And that gets into the problem of the agent and all of that. Uh, uh, you know, the people in their working years have to take care of not only the old to some extent, but of course they take care of the young. And uh, they sort of tie it with the old to what they've produced over life. They don't tie it that way in the young. I mean, if you have 10 children, and I mean, you still get you know, school places for each one of them and all of that. So that will be the challenge. I think we'll be up to that challenge, and we've certainly got the ingredients to be up to that challenge. We are wealthy. We are a wealthy family. And uh, a number of members of the family aren't really sharing in that the way I would hope they would. And you, of course, have spoken out uh, uh, quite loudly about this problem and your, and your viewpoint about what should be done about taxes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and you don't, ha any change in what you think about that? No, no, I, I, uh, I hesitate bringing it up, but even last year, my, my tax rate, counting payroll taxes, was the lowest in the, uh, in the office of 25 people, and, and uh, and I have no tax shelters. I just, just, uh, you know, thank you, lobbyists. You know, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> they've taken care of me. I mean, my, I have, I filed a tax return every year since I was 13, and we took the years by decades and compared tax taxes to taxable income. And the last decade, and believe me, it's been my best decade, uh, has been just about the lowest uh, of any decade in terms of my tax rate, and uh, uh, it, it was tougher when I was selling shirts at pennies. And a big part of this problem is that people never stop to think about the employment tax. The, the payroll tax is $900 billion. It's 30% it's 
of our total government expenditures, very roughly. And it quits at 100 and, I don't know, 5,000 or something like that. So it's regressive, basically. I mean, my payroll tax as a percentage of my total income is zilch, you know. The payroll tax of most of the people in the office as a percentage, you know, is, is now again 15 per plus percent. Mm -hmm. And if they've got spouses working, you know, you can have a household of 200,000 of income and they've got 15% payroll taxes right off the bat. Uh, it's, it's gotten pretty extreme. If you look at the distribution of taxes over the last, since World War II, you know, the, the payroll tax has just consistently gone up as a percentage of the total revenues of the government. Actually, and corporate income taxes have gone down dramatically. Corporate income taxes used to be 4% of GDP, they're not 1.5% of GDP. Corporate profits are at, at an all-time record. But we hear all the, the lobbyists for the corporations telling us how, you know, we're not competitive with the rest of the world and everything, which is a lot of baloney. <laughs> so there, and. <laughs> yeah, put okay. me down as undecided. Uh, <laughs> an another question right here? Uh, Hi, Alexandra Labenthal, Labenthal & Company. You entered the municipal bond insurance business at an interesting time, and I think subsequently had some second thoughts about right. it, and I would love to know your feelings on that industry now, especially given where certain cities and uh, commonwealths are. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did start guaranteeing uh, municipals uh, five years ago or so. At the time, we were getting premiums of probably over 3%, averaging over 3%, sometimes 4 or 5%. Uh, and in almost all cases, we had other municipal bond insurers that came ahead of us. So we were second to pay, third to pay, fourth to pay sometimes, and getting this pretty fat rate. And then the rates went down dramatically, and uh, uh, for the same risk within a year or two, we would have probably only been getting a, a quarter of the premium. And, you know, insurance is attractive at one price and it's not attractive at another price. So when rates, when rates leave us, you know, we leave the business, uh, basically, and that's what we did. If rates were high enough uh, or appropriate, in our view, as to the risk involved, uh, we would insure municipals again. I mean, we're selective about it, uh, 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 but we, we just weren't getting paid enough. Oh, oh right. Can I say say one thing? Oh, I have the mic on. Um, on behalf for the, for the sake of the Buffett family, for Susie, for other friends of Warren, Buffett is B U F F E T T. So if you're tweeting, Warren is verified. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Unless you're well, saying anything bad, in which case, spell any damn. <laughs> well, and, and I have a history, as you well know, of the first time I ever mentioned the name Buffett in Fortune uh, in 1966. I misspelled it. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never gotten over it. Um, so, okay. Uh, uh, over here? Okay. Uh, so, Warren, I'm glad that you... Uh, who are you? I'm sorry, Janice Elliott with Chaddock Elliott Executive Search Firm. So we have such a wealth of talent in this room, and I'm really glad that you're bullish on women. Huge. But, but don't you think we have a corporate governance issue in corporate America? You know, there's so many studies about if you have more women in the C-suite, more women in the boardroom, you have higher performance. Credit Suisse Research Institute in, in surveying 2,400 companies globally prove that, and so did McKinsey and other company and other research that's been done. But we have nearly 40% of the Fortune 500 have zero or one women in the boardroom. So how are we going to get this moving in the boardrooms with more women in the C-suite? I know you're a big proponent, but how is this going to happen? Yeah, well, I, I do like Berkshire as a teaching mechanism, and you know we'll show that to some extent at time, and, and have been at, at Berkshire. But, uh, listen, people in power don't give it up easily. You know, that's true in religion, it's true in the military, it's true every place. It's true. And, uh, and, and to some extent, there's just, it, it, it just doesn't surface much. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the, wrote the article. And then I addressed it specifically to men at the end. I think, you know, I, I said in the article, it makes me very bullish on America. When I think of how far this country came using half of its talent, I mean, just think of what the potential is using all of its talent. And we did just use half of the talent for a long time. I mean, it, and even the, even the 19th Amendment didn't, you know, didn't uh, affect change that fast. My sisters were born a couple of years each side of me on in 1930. 
and they are absolutely as smart as I am and, 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 and more personable, and, and, and they, uh, they did not have the same chances. And it wasn't, you know, my parents loved them all, loved them equally. The teachers sort of felt they all were entitled to the same chance, but it was just a thousand different ways. Uh, they were told that, you know, their job was to marry well or, you know, or maybe get a job as a secretary or a nurse. Or, and, and all of that talent went to waste. And I was lucky because I was only competing against half of the country. And uh, uh, I don't think it should stay that way. And, and, and it, it's moved a fair distance, but it's got a long way to go, too. And the point I, I, I don't know about, you know, in, in Europe, there's been some legislation of uh, percentages of women directors. And at the, I don't know whether that's the best way to go or not, but I think Berkshire is going to prove that a lot of women, talented women, can accomplish a whole lot for the shareholders. And talk just for a moment about the point you've made that uh, education and you and I uh, benefit, per, benefit oh, yeah. personally from the fact that women no. had so few careers open to us when sure. you and I, I were growing up. I went to public school in the, in the, in the mid to late 30s of grammar school, and, and I had nothing uh, but women teachers. And they were terrific. And of course, they should have been terrific because half of the talent of the country was being compressed into these few occupations, teachers, nurse secretaries, and retail clerks. And, and if you'd forced all of the men to become accountants, you'd have had one hell of a group of accountants, but, but you'd have wasted all kinds of talent. I mean, the idea of setting limits as to what talented people can do is just crazy. And that was being done in the 30s, and it benefited me because I would not have, those same teachers would have had jobs that paid better, many of them would have had jobs that had paid better and, and, and society would have been better off. But in terms of my own personal equation, I got the benefit of the fact that w wonderfully talented people were just being pushed into the slot that said teacher. We have time for one more quick question uh, right here. Hi, Elizabeth Gore, resident entrepreneur at the United Nations Foundation. Um, we admire so much your legacy in philanthropy and your children's philanthropy. I'd love to just hear your philosophy around that. Well, my friend Charlie said, uh, who gave away some money the other day, he says, it won't do me much good where I'm going. You know? So, the, you know, I've got everything in life I want. And, uh, you know, it uses a very tiny percentage of my resources. So I have a, some stock certificates that I bought 40 or 50 years ago down in a safe deposit box. And they have no utility to me. They, they can't buy anything from me that I, that I need or want. I mean, uh, I can go down and fondle them occasionally or something of the sort. But, <laughs> but other than that, they're just pieces of paper. They have enormous utility for other people, you know, and particularly if used wisely. They have no utility for me. So why in the world should I sit there and, and let them sit in a box? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I have never given away a penny that has affected my life in any way, shape, or form. There's people that this Sunday will drop $5 into a collection plate and it makes the difference between whether they go out for dinner or something or go to a movie. Uh, I've never done any of that. But if you have this incredible surplus, and in our giving pledge, we, we, we call these, we only call on people with a billion, you know, and I'm only asking them for half. So I, I say to my, when they turn me down, I say, you know, I'm gonna write a book on how to live on 500 million because there's apparently a big need for this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I found I could live on 500 million, so I, all the rest, and a lot less, and all the rest is surplus, and why not do, you know, if it can provide vaccines or education or whatever it may be, or a better life for women, I mean, why not use it? I think we're at the end of this, and I hope you'll join with me in thanking Warren for having been Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.